So chronologically speaking, the I am statement that we're going to read this morning is the last one that appears in John's gospel, and we're going to read uh, it from John chapter 15. But we're moving this one ahead um, so that next week on Palm Sunday, as Jesus makes his entry into Jerusalem as, as king, that we'll hear him say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then on Easter Sunday, as he is raised from the dead, that we'll hear Jesus say, I am the resurrection and the life. And so today we'll hear Jesus say, I am the true vine. And he says this while he's talking to his 11 disciples. 11 because Judas has already left him and betrayed him. Uh, and he's walking with his disciples between the, the upper room where he shared his last supper with them and the garden of Gethsemane where Jesus will pray and he'll sweat drops of blood and, and where he'll then be arrested and he'll be taken away to be crucified. And so Jesus is saying this. He says, I am the true vine only hours before he goes to the cross. And so as we hear God's word this morning from John chapter 15, we're going to read verses one to eight. We hear um, these words that Jesus says in the final moments with his disciples. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, before we dive into this I am statement where Jesus says, I am the true vine, let me say this. In this statement, Jesus gives us a picture of the gospel a picture of how he lived the perfect life for us. And then he laid down his life so that his life, his righteousness, his perfect fruitfulness are credited to all who are in him. And it is in fact only by his life that is given to us that we are truly alive and that we're able to bear fruit. And so when Jesus says, I am the true vine. It puts to rest the idea that we can impress God on our own behalf. The statement puts to rest the idea that we can earn our way to God on our own, that we can earn his grace, that we can earn our salvation by, by pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. It puts to rest the idea that we can impress God with our own righteousness and our own holiness without Christ. In fact, what this statement tells us is that we need a source of true life. And that source is Jesus. And Jesus communicates all of this to us when he says, I am the true vine. And so let's explore that statement together today and, and these verses so that we can understand what Jesus is telling us about himself and also what that means for us and how we live our lives today. Now, all throughout this series on the I am statements of Jesus, we've noted how Jesus uses familiar things. He uses symbols that, that people easily understood back then, images that, that people could connect with their daily lives. And he uses those things 
in order to communicate truth about himself and to help people understand who he really is. He used those things so that people would would make no mistake about what Jesus is saying about himself. And the same thing is happening today when Jesus says, I am the true vine. He's using an image that they knew well, a symbol that they understood to communicate an amazing truth about himself and about who he is. You see, all throughout the Old Testament, whenever the imagery of the vine was used, it was used to describe God's people. They were the the vine that God dug up from Egypt and transplanted in the promised land. They were the vine that God planted and cared for that, that they might bear good fruit. And yet what's interesting about this image of the vine is that every time it's used in the Old Testament, every time it's used as an image for God's people, it's used negatively. It's always followed by a pronouncement of judgment or an acknowledgement of judgment because although they were the vine that God transplanted and cared for and tended, they did not bear good fruit. Some passages in scripture talk about how they failed to bear fruit at all and others mention how they bore sour or wild grapes, useless fruit that, that was only good to be thrown out. They bore fruit that was not of the vine that they were supposed to be. And so anytime this image of the vine comes up in the Old Testament, God's people were reminded of their failure. They were reminded of how God had raised them up, how God had planted them, how God had tended to them. God called them to be this vine, but then they failed to live as his people. They failed to produce fruit. And so their protection was taken away. They were judged and they were sent away into exile. We read those images of of God's judgment in like passages like Isaiah chapter five. Now at the time that Jesus says, I am the true vine, the, the people of Israel had attempted to recapture this image in a more positive sense. There was a vine that had been sculpted into the the temple, symbolizing God's people. There was a vine that that was stamped on their money, uh, reminding them of their national identity as as God's vine. But the failures and, and the history wrapped up in that image were never far from mind. They knew that their only hope was not in somehow getting it right on their own and, some, and finally and somehow producing this fruit that God wanted. They had failed too many times to, to expect and to believe that that could happen. But their hope, their true hope was in the Messiah who would come, who, who they were waiting for to be the obedient and fruitful vine that they failed to be. That's what it says in Psalm 80 verses 16 to 18 a psalm about life after they were sent away in exile. In that psalm, it says this, your vine, that is Israel, is cut down. It is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Let your hand rest upon the man at your right hand, the son of man that you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. This was a prayer from God's people for God to send the man at his right hand to be the vine for them, to to come and to stand in for them, to do what they failed to do time and time again. For God to send the man at his right hand to be the vine. And so when Jesus says, I am the true vine, he's saying, I am the answer to that prayer. He's saying that he is the one that God raised up. He is the Messiah who has come to fulfill what Old Testament Israel uh, was called and failed to do. He's saying that he is the faithful and the obedient and the perfect vine, the one whom God sent to revive his people, to bring them back to life and to produce in them the fruitfulness that God desires. 
As Jonathan Parnell writes in a sermon on this passage, the focus on this whole conversation, that is the whole conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples, is that everything about the world and everything about God's history with humanity is now changed because of Jesus. When Jesus came to this earth, he came to be the true and better Israel that Israel had failed to be. And he came to be true and better human, the true and better human that we all have failed to be. And this is not just a side note about what Jesus did, living the perfect life for us. This is at the heart of his rescue mission. The kind of savior that we need, that you and I need is not just one who can get us out of trouble, but we need a savior who who can walk in our shoes and go through all that we've gone through and perfectly trust God and always do what God says and truly love others even when it's hard and then take all of that righteousness and all of his power and give it to us. That's what we need. And that's what Jesus has done. He doesn't just give us his death, but he gives us his life. Jesus gives us his holiness. Jesus gives us his fruitfulness because he is the true vine. And in verse five, Jesus tells us who we are. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. And just notice for a moment that this is a significant shift in the imagery from the Old Testament call on God's people of Israel. Then in in the Old Testament, they were called to be the vine, but Christ has come to fulfill that calling, to stand in that place, to take on and fulfill that responsibility on their and on our behalf. And so he is, or he becomes, or he comes as the true vine and we are branches. We're branches that are called to connect to the vine. And the interesting thing about branches is that they have no life in them, in and of themselves. Branches are alive and and branches only receive their life from the vine. They bear fruit because they're connected to the vine. They bear the fruit that the vine produces in them. But if a branch is not connected to the vine, it dies. And so as branches, it's not up to us to produce fruit on our own. It's not up to us to to bring about the kind of fruit that God desires. It's not up to us to, to try to figure out what that is as though we can make that happen on our own. As branches, we have one calling. There is one command in this passage. Jesus says, you are the branches. Remain in me as I also remain in in you. The focus on this passage and throughout this passage is on the vine. Jesus is the true vine. And if we are to be alive, if we are to produce fruit, we have to be connected to the vine. We have to be connected to him. We have to have his life flowing through us. And that command, remain in me as I also remain in you, simply means that that we have to have faith in Jesus. Faith that is a response to Jesus remaining in us already. And so we remain in Jesus by believing that he is our savior by believing that he lived for us a perfect life and died on the cross to pay the full penalty for our sins. And he rose again to give us new life. We remain in Jesus, the true vine, by by trusting that that he gives us life and and hope and only he restores us in our relationship with God. And we can remain in him more and more by by taking up spiritual practices. 
by investing in our relationship with Jesus through regular Bible reading and prayer and study and and obedience to God's word. For these practices, these things that we can do strengthen our faith, they strengthen our trust, and they draw us closer to Christ. They draw us closer to the vine. And so the question then is, if we're called to be branches, if we're called to be connected to the vine, if, if, if as we're connected to the vine, his life flows into us, the question is, how do we know that we're connected to the vine? And Jesus tells us that we know that we're connected to him by the fruit that we produce. Now remember that branches can only bear the fruit of the vine that they're connected to. And in fact, the life from the vine, the life that flows into the branch from the vine is what produces the fruit. So Jesus says, if we are in him, we will bear much fruit because he will produce fruit in us. And he'll do this in us and in our lives through the work of the Holy Spirit. And so by the fruit that is present in our lives, we are reassured that we're connected to the vine. And so what is this fruit? In Galatians chapter five, the apostle Paul tells us what what the fruit of the spirit looks like, what the fruit that that Jesus, uh, what his life produces in us looks like. The Apostle Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And note that as Paul says that he, he, he includes that word fruit as a singular. So these are not the fruits of the Spirit. This is the fruit of the Spirit. All of these things together, all of these things working together, this is the fruit of the Spirit. That the life of Jesus, as it flows in us, this is the fruit that it produces. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to all be perfectly all of those things. I mean, we, we won't be. But what Jesus is saying is that if we're connected to the vine, if we're connected to him, we will see this fruit growing in our lives. Now, it won't be exactly maybe where we want it to be or where it will be in the end. But but as we're connected to the vine, we will see this fruit growing. We'll see this fruit producing in our lives. And our hearts will grow in in a passion to, to see God's will be done. And we'll pray for that to happen. And we'll see that God answers those prayers. And so God will will change our heart through, the, through the, the life of the vine in us so that our prayers become prayers for his will to be done. And God answers those prayers every time. Now, there's still one reality of us being branches that, that we haven't talked about yet. And that is the presence of the gardener. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Vines that grow and that are left unattended and and so they can just kind of grow into this big, lush and full looking plant. Vines that grow like that bear very little fruit. And in order to increase the fruitfulness of a vine, what you have to do is is prune it. That means the dead branches in that vine, they must be cut off. And the branches that do bear fruit must be pruned. So they must be cut back so that they will bear more fruit. And this is the work that Jesus tells us the gardener does. And for us, honestly, this can be a painful reality. Sometimes we have this false view of the Christian life that it's supposed to be this easy life where we go from one joy to the next and to the next and to the next and every day is is better than the one before. But as we see this picture that Jesus gives us, 
We should hear that as a correction to that false view of the Christian life where everything is great. Pruning is the process of cutting off part of the branch so that the rest of the branch will bear more fruit. And Jesus says, this is the work that the father does. And there are no branches that are left untended. The dead ones are cut away and cut off and thrown into the fire. And the ones that are living, the ones that are bearing fruit, they are pruned. They're cut back so that they will bear more fruit. And so Jesus is telling us that that by his loving care, the father prunes us so that we will be more fruitful and we should expect pruning. We experience this sometimes when, when, when maybe the father puts us in these situations that are painful or uncomfortable for us at the time. But the reason why they're painful or uncomfortable is because God is using that situation or that circumstance to prune us, to, to cut things out of our lives that hinder our ability to be fruitful. And so he cuts those things away so that we can be more fruitful. And so through those situations, he actually causes our faith to grow and he actually causes us to bear more fruit, even if it hurts or even though it hurts at the time. Now, let me say this. No one likes to be pruned. It it hurts. It's difficult. It's painful. But the father prunes us and he prunes us lovingly so that we will bear more fruit. And often it's during these times of difficulty, during these times of pruning that we grow the most. I can say for myself, from my own experience, that the time that I probably experienced the most growth or the the most, uh, yeah, growth in faith and in producing uh, fruit would be about 13 years ago when I had an eye infection that caused me to go blind. Now, I, I don't ever want to have to go back to that experience and to walk through that experience again, but God used that experience to help me grow, to help me and, and to help me in my life to be more fruitful. And now I know that I have a long, long way to go and there's There's probably a lot of pruning that is ahead of me in my life. But this is the work that the father undertakes in us. He prunes us, the branches, so that we will bear the fruit of Christ. And throughout this passage, Jesus tells us that the goal for branches, the goal for for us is fruitfulness. That we would bear his fruit in our lives as we're connected to the vine. And our hope in God's gracious promise is this, Jesus, our true vine, makes that possible for us. As branches that are connected to him, his life, his grace, his mercy, his fruitfulness flows into us to produce fruit in our lives. And so may we remain ever close to the vine. May we remain ever connected to Jesus so that that this process of receiving his life and, and it turning into fruit in our lives so that that process happens more and more for the glory of God. Let's pray together. Lord, our God, we thank you that that you sent Jesus for us to live the perfect life, to stand in our place, to be the true vine. God, help us as branches to remain in him, to stay connected to him, to trust in him more and more. Help us to draw close to him so that his fruit would be evident and and would be uh, produced in our lives. And Lord, as we experience pruning at your hands, Help us to receive it, Lord, as a gift from you. In trust that you are pruning us so that we would be more fruitful and for your glory. We pray this all through Christ's name. Amen.